I've been asked to share some of the experiences of building Icebreaker and also try and look at some of the ways we've applied uh, design thinking to our business. So it's kind of, it'll be a bit of a hybrid, it won't be a textbook design talk at all. Um, it's just kind of some stories sort of which have occurred to me. So Icebreaker is 21 years old this year. I was born in Wellington in uh, 29 uh, Maida Vale Road in my bedroom and um, we've had a number of offices around here and our corporate offices are head offices which aren't very corporate. Um, we moved up to Wellington, uh, Auckland three years ago. Okay so um, I'm going to tell you kind of some stories really about the evolution of the business. This is our uh, revenue curve as of last year. This year we'll, we'll hit about 230 million. It looks like a nice kind of smooth curve after a bit of a slow start, but I, I can assure you we were, you know, ducks on the water, uh, paddling pretty hard to um, keep that momentum. It all started with a plan, actually. <laughs> and the experience for me has been of having a plan which has a, a very strong sense of the future and then frantically rewriting it every couple of years um, when the external environments change so much. So I, the thing I love about this plan, this is what I wrote in my bedroom, is that the, the vision um, really has always been the same. It's kind of a question, how do we build an international brand from New Zealand? And what does that look like? And also at a more tactical level, how do we create a totally different category in the outdoor industry using natural fibres? Because when Icebreaker started, everything was synthetic. So we had kind of like a, a business strategy, which was us being a category creator, and we had a bigger vision, which was about how do you actually build an international brand from New Zealand? Because when I was 24 starting Icebreaker, we didn't really have many. Fish from Pika was about as good as you got. Anchor butter, you know, it's just kind of butter. But that was pretty much, anchor butter was kind of the case study. And then it was really Fish from Pika, Paikal. That's not a New Zealand company anymore. And there were a couple other micro ones. So I found that challenge very inspiring. Now we're very much a work in progress. Um, and we haven't got it sorted, but we're making good progress. It's a photo of uh, me as a baby on a sheepskin with the Southern Alps in the background. My mother thinks that because of that she's responsible entirely for <laughs> Icebreaker. <laughs> These are the two original Icebreaker garments. Um, I was given that uh, t-shirt by a merino wool farmer that I met. He lived in Pawanui Island in Marlborough Sounds. And I fell in love with that feeling pretty much. I was so surprised because I'd been on a five-day kayaking trip. Remember the striped polypropylene that was like, you know, the super cool stuff? <laughs> um, it was good when it came out of the packet. It got uh, pretty stinky and pretty, that horrible kind of greasy feeling after a day or two. So it just seemed like there was a problem to solve because that was pretty much the dominant product in the market, ever, ever warm polypropylene and there were no natural alternatives uh, at all and yet when you think about what New Zealand was known for it was known for uh, adventure with the whole bungee jump thing it was known for natural beauty with our amazing Southern Alps and it was known for sheep so there was this kind of latent story uh, which was very much a reflection of New Zealand identity that was waiting to be pulled together. And I personally was wanting to be based in New Zealand and find a way of travelling around the world the whole time. I had this, part of my personal vision was to be a New Zealander and live between North America, Europe, Asia and New Zealand. And I, I've spent pretty much four months a year, in fact I'm off to Europe tomorrow, I've spent four months a year living in that triangle with New Zealand as my home. Um, for for 21 years. So it wasn't a great product in terms of visually, but it felt amazing and the bones of an idea were there. So if we could unpick 
what the real story of Icebreaker was. That was what the original challenge was. We've got so much latent potential in this country and we haven't been fantastic at being able to kind of unpick the real essence of our powerful stories or our powerful products. And we've got so much latent potential. So really it was like, here's this product and my first insight was, wow, this feels totally different. I went running in it, I went mountain biking in it. It didn't hold odor, I didn't overheat. It f didn't feel prickly. I could throw it in the washing machine. It wasn't made of plastic, it wasn't stinky. Um, but it was quite expensive and it would have failed. If I put that on the market, it would have gone because everyone hated wool. I hated wool. Wool was itchy and heavy and prickly and what I had to wear when I was a kid. So it needed this sense of identity and impact wrapped around it. A lot of the insights actually came from spending time first on that Reno station with Brian Brackenridge in Poanui Station with his family, I remember going running in an icebreaker and having this incredible powerful sense of wearing a product from that place in that environment and that kind of, that born worn thing was had a very powerful impact on me. And also there was a lot of wonderment in the relationship between that family and that environment and the animals. There was this, there was a sense of it being intergenerational and there was a sense of kinship and there was kind of a special relationship there and it wasn't intensive, it wasn't like a factory farm, it was extensive and it was really trying to let nature do its thing and I found that very powerful. I grew up in Christchurch and my dad's a doctor and my mum's a, a homemaker and a potter and artist and it was a very different world for me so I'm not from a farming background at all. So this kind of underlying sense of what you could do wearing the product and where the product came from, the sense of appellation, was really the essence of icebreaker. And the word icebreaker really was about icebreaking, about new ideas, about new relationships of both the fibre against the skin, but also um, I guess telling some of these hidden stories that are so central to our identity as New Zealanders. We did some pretty outrageous imagery. The reason was success for me wasn't selling in bivouac and r, &R sport. Success for me was how do you get into Snow and Rock in the UK or some of the big stores in the US and Canada. And to do that we had to be quite outrageous because no one wanted a picture of a sheep, you know, because that would have just reminded them of wool. We needed to have, we needed to take risks in order to cut through and be different. Just about every brand in the outdoor industry was telling the same story. It was sweaty men climbing mountains faster than other sweaty men carrying ice axes. <laughs> it was pretty much the whole thing, right? The North Face did it, MacPack did it. Feridun did it. Uh, I mean, everyone did that. Sweaty men uh, trying to get to the top of Everest faster than another sweaty man. So we went, okay, right, being different is kind of like the opposite of that. We were gender equal. We showed men and women ice breaking between people. We showed sensuality and kinship with nature as opposed to conquering it and we showed natural fibres against skin as opposed to kind of shielding yourself from the environment wearing only plastic layers. Um, and, that, and then we'd wrap it up, so the bones of that was good, and then we'd wrap it up in some quite outrageous imagery that it's a naked woman riding a kind of a half sheep, half man leading the stampede. It was kind of some of this old Greek mythology that we'd twist with. The Europeans loved it, the Canadians loved it, the Americans hated it. They thought it was devil worship, um, quite literally. People would rip our catalogues out. So we actually got off to a slow start in the US. It's taken us about 10 years to understand that country and given recent events, uh, we've had to rethink everything we understand about America. But uh, it's a work in progress. But this sense of being bold as a challenger brand 
is something that we can do from New Zealand because we only have to be a nation of niches. A couple of hundred million, that's great for a New Zealand company. It's really tiny for an international brand. Our competitors are the North Face, 2.5 billion. You know, Patagonia, 1.3 billion. They're big companies, right? So we're this niche micro player with, with heaps of uh, headroom. And when you're the little guy from a little place, you've got to take risks. Our customers kind of caught on to this, and these are photos that our customers have sent us over the years. So because I was the customer and all my friends were the customers, our feedback loop was very direct. It was what my flatmates were telling me. It's what we were doing on the weekends. You know, you'd go into stores, I'd work in the shops, I'd talk with customers. So I pretty much was the kind of insight merchant because the business was really small, right? First year sales, 110,000, 330, 750, 1.1. Took us four years to get to a million dollars, which is nothing. Um, you know, our Wellington store does more than that. These stories were not, were not sweaty men climbing mountains. These were people doing outrageous things. It was all about self-expression and the human spirit. So, so much of the inspiration for me behind their brand has been tapping into <coughs> some of the crazy, enough, crazy stuff that human beings love doing when they're being fully self-expressed in their environment. And as you see the trends, there's more and more people living in cities you know, as we cluster in cities, um, we're becoming more detached from our environment, not so much in a place like Wellington where you're surrounded by it, but certainly in the bigger cities of the world. So the role of nature is something to rekindle the human spirit and to be a playground to kind of form relationships both with yourself and with other people goes up. So I think actually the role of outdoor clothing is going to become more important. So we created some different categories and we have a whole innovation process which works two years into the future. But actually so much of the inspiration was being able to take, this is our US sales team like 10 years ago and that's Jim Murray from Lake Tekapo, actually Glenmore Station, it's uh, just next to Gla in Lake Tekapo, and being able to connect our end, uh, actually I was going to say our end customers, they're actually not, they're our sales guys. So being able to connect the people to teach them to become powerful storytellers. So when they went back to America or Canada or uh, the UK, they were icebreakers, they were Kiwis with the Kiwi spirit, even though they were Canadians or Americans or Europeans. So they kind of became us. A very important principle behind icebreaker is not sending Kiwis everywhere. So in Germany, a business is run by Germans. In Canada, it's almost exclusively Canadians. A couple of Kiwis there to loosen them up a bit. <laughs> but um, but um, it's all about being uh, as local as possible. Remember Toyota used to be like the brand, Toyota Hilux? And there was that concept of glocalizing. How can you take a glo global brand and make it local? So. The Kiwi farmer adopted the Hilux as their utility vehicle, yet it was designed by some Japanese guys in Tokyo, right? So the fact that, and Hyundai have out, um, uh, out Toyota, Toyota, but that's a Korean brand which New Zealand does now feel as a New Zealand brand. So my goal was when we're in Switzerland, we want Icebreaker to feel Swiss and run by Swiss people and be adopted by the Swiss culture, but with New Zealand as a key component of the identity and of the backbone. But it's not just about, you know, by New Zealand everywhere we go, it's about being able to integrate into different cultures and be part of the social fabric of the different countries that we work in. And we do that through the people that we have, because 85% of our business is in the Northern Hemisphere. Um, it was outside of New Zealand, sorry. 75 is in the Northern Hemisphere. And 80% um, of our team are not New Zealanders, even though we're a New Zealand-based company. It's because one of the questions for was, how do you build an international brand from New Zealand, was you make it local in each market. Now that has very profound impacts for the design process because the insights can't then come from New Zealanders. The insights then need to come from the customers. So the teams that we have in Germany, 
need to be very good at understanding not only the needs of our wholesale partners, because we supply in Germany 900 outdoor and snow sports stores. We have to understand them, but also we have to understand the consumers that go into those stores, in Sport Schuster or Sport Conrad. And they're totally different from the customers going into Snow and Rock in the UK. There is no European, right? You know, there's, for us, there's 13 different countries that count. The Norwegians are totally different from the Swedes. There is no Scandinavia, even. So we have to be quite specific. And it is actually one of the hardest uh, challenges for our design team. Who do you listen to? The Austrians want pink, the Germans want green, the Americans want something which is huge, the Italians <laughs> want something which is very slim, you know, it's like, it can't be everything, right? So h how do we choose who to listen to is one of our key questions. So it's all very good getting insights. Um, it's like, what's the business strategy that governs what you, what you choose to listen to and importantly, what you choose to um, put to the side. This is Robert Butson. I've been working with him for 17 years since we started our contracts directly with growers. We started our contracts with growers in 1997 because I got a letter from a grower saying, uh, you're a dick, basically, because you're a, my garments are falling apart and you're, an excuse, you're a disgrace to the industry. So I was just about in tears, right? I was trying to kind of celebrate the industry and all these amazing things, and here she was. Uh, telling me I was a disgrace. And the reason was we couldn't control the quality because this batch of garments, they were all falling apart. Um, they were fuzzing up. So I went back to uh, where we got our yarn made in Moscow and they said, no, nah, same yarn, you know, look, here's the specs. And I went to Waimati, we got it knitted. Ralph said, same knitting as everywhere else. Went to Lance Textiles in Timaru where we got them finished and to Tamuka where the woman chopped them up. And uh, everything was done the same. And actually the breakdown was there was a variation in the raw material. There was a fibre breakdown where um, there was a batch of wool which had a very low tensile strength because the animals were under stress. Low tensile strength for the wool geeks in the room um, is when a fibre fractures. When it fractures you get small fibres, they come out uh, when a garment is worn. So the big insight for us was, unless we are controlling the quality of the raw material as an input, we can't actually guarantee a consistently high quality product. And when you're competing against synthetics, which are totally consistent, because you get a block of plastic and you melt it down and you force it out of the tube, you put chemicals on it and you knit it together, that is a totally reliable um, process. So the breakthrough for us, for us was working with people like Robert. What he needed was a long-term contract which gave him the ability to lock in pricing. What we needed was some guarantees around on-farm practices so bad stuff didn't happen, so we didn't get flushed down the toilet, and also uh, incredibly high quality standards around uh, fibre specifications so we could make consistent products. So we work with about 200 families. We buy about 1,400 tonnes of merino, which is roughly a quarter of the uh, merino clip. And we've been running that system um, successfully for six, 16 or 17 years. So I just love going back to these places. That's his daughter, Kate, who runs it now. And there's three generations that wear icebreaker, including uh, little uh, Jack there. And this is another family with my marketing team and three of my daughters uh, having dinner with them. So I just think as a cornerstone, actually working with growers is a way of getting rich stories, insights around manufacturing processes, and then working out what is the win-win to be unlocked. What is the win-win to be unlocked? So both parties in the value chain can uh, benefit. That's been a cornerstone of um, how the our supply chain has managed to work and it's worked um, smoothly for a long period of time. Okay, so that's kind of like the foundation stuff. We got our, our brands right, we got our product strategy set, we set some principles, we worked out how to um, overcome inconsistent product and we had the bones of, uh, the bones of kind of a good business that was ready to start being scaled. And also importantly, I had 
absolutely no idea what I was doing and I was only just slightly beginning to, you know, I had like my 30th birthday here, I was just slightly kind of getting my head around how to be a leader and a manager for the business. I was doing everything myself and then I was learning how to delegate. So there's a direct relationship between my personal evolution and you'll notice that in your work and your personal evolution as leaders and the um, impact you can have on your organisation and the productivity of your organisation. So the next piece then was how we start building, we get this little team in New Zealand and how we can start finding um, people who can be us uh, internationally. So we've got uh, five offices around the world in manufacturing in, uh, in Asia, in uh, uh, Vietnam and China, even though the fibre comes from here. So there was one key person, Fran, in fact the first seven people I hired were all women and um, four of those people worked with me for over ten years. So the real culture of the business um, was, was set up by those early people. And Fran and I went round and would go to outdoor stores and would observe the behaviour in Europe, say, and then we'd find out who the good distributors were and then we'd try and basically find the right partners who could represent us in the market. Sometimes we'd work directly with, a, uh, end, um, with an end consumer, for example, in the UK, but then it was for the purposes of finding a distributor. So a distributor is someone who buys our product and then resells it. We get a lower margin, but they effectively take the risk and use their warehouse and pre-buy the product. So it's a good way for a young, small brand with no cash to scale a business because you de-risk it and you get, you, you get high sales for a low margin, which is a good trade-off when you're at that stage. So, um, my dream was to get into Snow and Rock because I saw that as the pinnacle of retail in Europe. They were based in the UK. And I basically went to all the trade shows and pleaded with the buyer to have an appointment. Um, and after about four gins one night she relented and I turned up um, with my little suitcase and my samples and she gave me a, a sample order. Her name was Sharon Campbell. Sample order. Sample order for like 40,000 bucks, right? I didn't tell her that was the biggest order we had ever had. <laughs> I went, 40 grand? Yeah, okay, well that'd, that'd be a useful start, uh, Sharon. <laughs> and that was on the condition that I'd go in and I'd do this clinics myself. I'd, the clinics were when you'd turn up and you'd get all the people together and you'd buy them coffees in the morning or pizza after work and you'd tell them stories and you'd effectively try and train groups to become storytellers so they could be us to their customers. You'd give them free product and you'd kind of make them feel part of it. It's very important. Um, this kind of people to people contact. So I did that for three years and the sell through was good. We got up to like a hundred and something um, thousand in terms of orders for Snow and Rock. And after three years I said, Sharon, I'm exhausted. I can't keep on doing this, you know. You've got more and more stores. I need a partner. Who's the right partner in the UK? And she goes, there's one guy who's perfect for you, Corey Taylor. Um, he's got all the big brands. And the problem with people with big brands is they don't need small brands that require heaps of energy and high maintenance and may or may not work in a category that no one's heard of in a country that everyone thinks is Australia. <laughs> so, um, so she rang him and she said, um, Corey, there's someone I'd like you to meet, Jeremy Moon, he's got a company called Icebreaker. And he goes, Karen, you know, Sharon, can't you see how busy I am? And she <laughs> leant forward down the phone and said, um, Corey, you're not understanding me. If you don't meet Jeremy, I'm going to cancel my £500,000 mountain hardware order. <laughs> to which point he said, oh, sorry, I did miss here. you. I'd be delighted. Why don't you uh, send him out and come and visit? So I stayed with him for the weekend. Um, ended up being uh, best man at his wedding. And, and, uh, and 14 years later, we're still business partners in the UK. And we supply 700 stores in the, in the UK. So there's something about the, the advantage of coming from a neutral country like New Zealand and being able to take risks and build relationships and kind of be a good listener. So I think probably one of my strongest traits uh, is to be a good listener 
And really, the whole point about the design thinking process is to be a good listener. It doesn't matter if you call it insights or empathy or whatever your process is, you're really trying to listen to what is actually going on. And it's often not what people are saying, right? Because often what people are saying is what used to happen. So how we get those insights by balancing what the industry is saying, what futurists are saying around colours and trends, what our consumers are saying, because our consumers are way more advanced than the industry because our industry is really selling what people designed last year to people and then measuring last year's sales behaviour and then going and then pretending that they're trends. Really most of the trends live in consumer behaviour. Um, so, so for us it, it's, it's, a very, it's a very fine balance around what you listen to in terms of the forward indicators and the industry indicators. And the consumer work is something which we're kind of doubling down on right now. Um, I've got a new head of marketing who's very rich in the area. And basically, all our work now is, is prototyping and testing against uh, a few key cities that we've identified as the most influential. Not the 700 cities that we sell in, uh, the six cities that for us will be the future of Icebreaker. The other thing that we did was we, this is a visual model that came from a prototyping session. It's basically an adaptation of a whiteboard where we just mapped our whole value chain to understand how we fit it in as an organisation. And we don't own any of the stuff. We don't own a farm, we don't own a sheep, I don't even own any sewing machines. We've owned lots of kind of space and intellectual property and <coughs> computers and stuff that let people um, be really effective managers. But we don't own any of the supply chain. That's a bad place for us to put capital. There's much smarter experts who will invest capital in the back end. So Icebreaker really is this system that starts with the families and farms and ends with the consumers that end up wearing our product uh, in the Northern Hemisphere predominantly. <coughs> OK, so that kind of gets us to, to this phase. And because we'd started the export business here, that's effectively when the snow and rock thing <coughs> began to kick off. That's when I had to change the manufacturing. And everyone goes, oh, you're not a New Zealand-made company anymore. It's like, oh, my God. Um, and it was one of the toughest decisions I ever had to make. And thank God we made it, because we would have absolutely been killed by our competitors if we hadn't. And New Zealand manufacturing was incredibly unsophisticated. It was a bunch of small uh, companies with, with outdated technology, because there hadn't been investment in the uh, apparel industry for years, because with the deregulation Basically, people couldn't compete. Our biggest supplier, um, Lane Walker Rudkins, um, ended up going broke, and they were delivering typically about three months late. So when you make promises to com companies like Snow and Rock, and you're delivering late, they give they give you a bill because they haven't been able to sell that product. You've cost them money. So we had to get access to the same level of technology as our competitors, the same level of scale. And we also had to get ourselves out of the New Zealand dollar because at about that point, uh, we reached the kind of 50-50 offshore versus New Zealand uh, in terms of sales. And New Zealand dollar, you know how volatile it is, it's absolutely hopeless um, to run a business from when you're predominantly uh, overseas. So. Um, when we did that, it was actually interesting. Like my big insight was, it's not where it's made; it's so much how it's made. It's the quality of the partners, their environmental practices, the social ethics they have in place, and the transparency that allows full vis visibility into that. So I feel like I feel really good actually about the quality of our um, manufacturing, and happy to talk about that later. It was considerably higher, environmentally, socially, and ethically in some cases than what we were doing in uh, New Zealand. It was quite, it was mind blowing for me actually. So this basically was kind of kicking through and getting these offshore markets beginning to work, powered by this big engine room that we had set up in China and Vietnam. In China, by the way, it's not a whole bunch of Chinese 
companies. It's a French company based in China that cleans the wool, that sends it to a German company based in China using an Italian plant that spins the wool, which sends it to a Japanese-Chinese joint venture textile plant based in China. It's this United Nations based in Shanghai, which has, in our industry, the highest level of innovation in the world. Um, and then it goes to a Dutch company that do international logistics. So it's like, it's kind of a place. <laughs> um, it's not necessarily a nationality um, that we gravitate it to. That led us uh, power on. About here, there were, um, the whole industry started to change because of uh, dot com, right? Everyone started buying, just started to buy online. The old fashioned retailers started to die not being able to compete because they couldn't compete on price and if they weren't good they couldn't compete on service and the internet was really about you know lower lower price access to lower price or the kind of zappos amazon type model which was about you know making it really really relentlessly simple you don't have to drive across town and be disappointed that they have the wrong size or the wrong color you know what you're getting so the industry found it really tough. Um, you know, it was part of the GFC as well, but um, we had to really rethink things. So the, the insight was, hey, look, a third of our wholesale partners are going to be broke in between five and ten years, and we don't know which third. We can place a few bets. We need to start hedging against that. So we started our own uh, retail channel as well and invested heavily in our online business. Now that was super challenging because you have a whole organisation which is aligned around being a wholesale company. A wholesale company sells to someone else and you invest everything in that relationship. When you've got your own retail stores, your own online business, you need totally different skills, totally different skills and a totally different mindset because the customer shifts from being the, the reseller to the consumer. So it was a super challenging time and absolutely critical for the future of the organisation. So we shifted from a sole focus to that to beginning to open our own retail stores. We've got 30 of our own retail stores between Canada, a couple in Europe, um, North America and New Zealand and Australia. And our online business is roughly 10% of our sales and will be 20% of our sales uh, in another five years. So I thought I'd just quickly take you through a little piece that we went through because I've pulled out some odd slides that I shared when I was um, doing some work at Stanford University a while ago. Um, I bought in a company, IDEO, to teach us design thinking because Better By Design wasn't really Better by Design wasn't really, it was kind of getting its head around how we best teach design thinking and I thought I'd better apply it internally before we start um, using it through uh, Better by Design. I, I co-founded Better by Design uh, 11 years ago with a group of other people um, and I've been a chair since then. So as, as part of my role and chair of Better by Design, it's been trying to find the few areas that we can invest deeply in and becoming world class at and then learning how best to scale them within organisations such as the relationship we've had uh, with your organisation which we're very proud of. So this was kind of us. We started with the, um, gathering insights and creating some different uh, possibilities. We did a lot of our prototyping just literally superimposing uh, pictures over images of different spaces, just being able to kind of imagine the consumer journey. And then we built um, the whole store. I got a building that was roughly the size of a site that we found in New York City. I thought would start very scary in New York, um, just to focus everyone, including me. There's a lot of rent to pay, so we had to make it work. And we built, we built the whole store out of polystyrene over a weekend just to see a bit of a sense of scale and how it could work. And then we printed out different pieces and we kind of stuck it on it. That isn't lots of boxes, that's a picture of lots of boxes. So we just wanted to kind of get a sense of how we can lay out, um, lay out the space. Because we had one store in Wellington Airport 
that was trading well because Lloyd Morrison uh, talked me into, he tricked me into opening that Wellington Airport store. And we needed to kind of have the next um, evolution of that. And bang, there it is, that's in uh, Soho. And that kicked off our North American strategy. So why didn't we do more and more stores in New Zealand? Because Success for Icebreaker was how we become an international brand from New Zealand. And we had to force ourselves to kind of, you know, almost underinvest in the New Zealand market. Um, and so we could put the necessary focus uh, on the overseas market. Fortunately, I hired a fantastic general manager who's really breathed, breathed life into the New Zealand market because I think it did get a bit neglected for a while. And we've got some amazing plans uh, and really, really making great progress in New Zealand again. But we had to go overseas and kind of um, learn some tough lessons before we could come back home and apply them. Um, that's the store we just opened in Calgary in uh, Canada. That's the store we got in Portland, Oregon. So across the business, when I was reflecting on uh, in that conversation around what I could share, we've applied prototyping to how we've designed core systems across the business, how we've set up new processes within the business, you know, using different people as part of the prototype and build team. We've mapped models of the customer journey. Our whole first website was using a design thinking process even how we do uh, reporting to get the right inputs from the readers of the report as opposed to a little IT guy popping up with what the perfect report should be and everyone being disappointed, which is what we were famous for for years. And also new product development in terms of how we're now involving our customers, select customers from a few key cities um, in the product development process so we can stay relevant. And ultimately that whole business model, that whole ecosystem I saw you was just a whole kind of application of many prototypes put together at a meta level. And being able to observe the business at a meta level as a business model lets us understand where our strengths and weaknesses are, what core assumptions we've got and how those assumptions are being constantly changed through um, the macro environments as well as the internal forces within the company. Um, which are constantly changing. So whatever we've kind of set up needs to be torn down and rebuilt every two to three years. So learning to be adaptable, um, the only people that have succeeded at Icebreaker over a long period of time have been people who were very open-minded and very adaptable. And you'll notice as your organisation continues to evolve, the real leaders will be the people who are embracing the change and people who are naturally holding on to the old ways uh, can sometimes be, find this process very tough. And, um, and the point of it is to notice when you find it tough and go, that's okay, it's a chance to let go of some stuff and it's a personal growth moment when you're going through change. So um, it's not about um, it being an easy process, it's about being an inclusive process to allow people to have their voice shared and to experience personal epiphanies both in how they relate to other people, how you relate to other people, but also epiphanies within yourself. It's like, wow, I didn't know I felt like that. How come I'm being so defensive here? You know, or my goodness, I didn't know I was a creative person. There's things which I didn't know I was capable of. This really is the power of the design thinking process and that's why it has um, energy. Uh, if there's uh, the sufficient courage to keep it through um, the distance. It's not really something which you come in and do, it's more a mindset um, that is adapted and evolved and encouraged over time. And it's a bit like a martial art, you know, if, or playing an instrument. If you put it down for too long, you can kind of pick it up. It doesn't take long to get back at it again, but you're constantly needing uh, to practice it. We're tricking along. Um, the final piece was about probably my personal evolution. So I'd been chipping away at Rob Fife to um, get on our board, and he got on our board uh, five years ago. And then I set myself the task of convincing him to be a CEO, which took me almost two years. And, um, and the belief was that 
my strength and my weakness is that I've only worked in Icebreaker for 21 years, right? And I'm good at a few things, but I'm not a classic CEO. I'm more a kind of a, I like building things and I like tearing things down and I like being a change agent. And what the organisation needs is a very experienced CEO that can reduce complexity and simplify and keep us very really focused on the few things. And Rob, there's no one better than Rob, in my opinion, at doing that. And what he did turning around in New Zealand, I still think is totally remarkable. And the way he did it, and the fact that that organisation has gone to strength, to strength after he left, I think is amazing. So we did a deal where we effectively kind of swapped uh, roles. And um, he's been our uh, CEO for almost two years. In fact, for two years and about a week, yeah. So part of getting that ready was why I moved the office from Wellington to Auckland. So I went up a year early and kind of found a space and, and we included our team and our customers as we were looking at the design for that. And we built a space which is very reflective of our culture and of our values and uh, has a very strong sense of identity in storytelling. It was an amazing process. The values that we aligned on as a business were about the importance of being authentic, both as people and as a brand, of being adventurous, being able to take risks, both in our physical life, being able to go out and do stuff, but also as a business, going into new areas and being prepared to make some bets and knowing that we're going to not going to win uh, all of them. Being achievers, Rob's brought a real professionalism in and a sense of discipline and accountability that wasn't my strength. Um, and being passionate. Because we're a cause company, we're about changing the outdoor industry towards nature-based solutions. And those solutions happen to come from the best country in the world, New Zealand. There's a certain passion and a energy that that carries with it. That's why I'm so inspired about the company after 21 years. So we wanted a space that reflected that. It's very open, it's very natural, it's flat. Rob and I share a desk down the end. No one's got any offices. There's heaps of meeting rooms. There's lots of published ideas, published processes, and people effectively sharing their work. So being able to create an environment to encourage that type of activity. For us, it ended up being the whole office. Um, but before that, it was just rooms, and that's good enough. But having a space which encourages creativity and sharing is important. So there's some reflections from my journey. Maybe it sparks some thoughts about where you guys are going as a team and individually. So thank you very much for um, inviting me in today.